screen actors. In today's video, we're going to explore the question, do you really want to be an actor? Huh? To some of you, that might seem like a strange question. I assure you it's not. In fact, you should be asking this at different points in your career just to stay on track so that you're always in the driver's seat. You're making choices that serve your life and your career best. I'm Luis DiBianco and my channel is Screen Acting Success. If this is your first time here, definitely click subscribe and give the video a thumbs up. Okay, you ask the question, do I really want to be an actor? And you answer yes. Great. Now, make sure to answer this very important fundamental question. Why do you want to be an actor? There are basically two main reasons. One is you're really hungry for fame and fortune and everything that comes with them. And you know, if that's your reason, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just be clear and honest about it. The other reason is that you must act. It's your way of being alive in the world. It's your form of artistic expression that gives meaning to everything that you do. Basically, you must act. It's a question of life or death, spiritual, inner life or death. Can you have both the artistic expression and the fame and fortune? Absolutely. But be clear about which one is your main driver and then focus your energy at the beginning, especially on the things that will get you to that main goal. And often the other one will follow right along with it. Let's explore the second one first. You act because you must. It's your form of being alive. It's your, it's your art. If that's your answer and you really, really believe that and you haven't explored stage, start doing it now. Stage is the foundation for all great acting. Al Pacino, whom we know as a great film actor, began his career on stage. It remains his main passion and his love. And often when he's not doing film, he goes back and does challenging plays that help him to grow, that, that stretch his talents and his abilities, and yes, make him feel intensely alive. So. You start to explore the stage. Start reading a lot of plays. Read plays from not only contemporary ones, but read plays from the beginnings of modern drama. Do you know who the fathers of modern drama were? Heinrich Ibsen and August Strindberg. Read their plays. Read the playwrights that followed them. Learn something about stage craft. Because how you perform on stage, well, it makes different demands on you than the camera does. Because the stage is very much a verbal medium. That's why in plays, there's a lot more language, a lot more dialogue than there are in good film scripts. Because in film, TV and movies, this is a visual medium and the storytelling doesn't depend as much on dialogue. In fact, you probably have heard me say a lot that the dialogue is less important than you imagine. It's much more about what's happening here and here inside. Along with stage, it would definitely benefit you to learn something about theater history, about how acting developed, how stagecraft developed. Okay, 
You answer the question the other way. You say, well, I like artistic expression, but I'm really driven more by, I want to be a star. I want to be famous. Don't be ashamed of it. I know that there are acting teachers who um, get very haughty about this. They make people feel that if they're not in it for the art, there's something wrong with them. That's nonsense. In fact, when I was a much younger and more arrogant person, I used to believe that too. I certainly don't anymore. So if you're aiming more for the fame and fortune and stage doesn't even interest you that much, you're more interested in doing television and film, then, especially if you're beginning, learn as much as you can about the camera. Learn the technical stuff. What does the camera see? How does it perceive you? What does it love and what does it hate? What is your chemistry with the camera? And I mean your chemistry even when you're not acting. When you're just standing here in front of the camera and it's telling some kind of story just by seeing your face and bringing your face onto a screen. What is that chemistry? Really, really study types. Define what your type is in film. Different types. Action hero. The girl next door. The boy next door. The bad girl. The bad boy. The villain, the hero, the heroine, the um, dangerous one, the goofy one, the funny one. Which one is your main hit on camera? And what characters will allow you to explore that type best? One thing that many actors don't study when they even when they're in film and TV for a while, is a real detailed understanding of the frame and the different shots. The different shots and the different frames are going to determine what, how you should perform. If you're performing the same way in an extreme close-up as you are in a medium shot or in a long shot, then you're doing something wrong. Find out as much as you can about that. You see, if you decide that fame and fortune, that's your North Star, well, you can bypass some of the other stuff. I know that some acting teachers might be upset when they hear me say this, because, well, people can make great careers and a great business out of playing one specific type over and over again. The difference is that actors who are in it because of the art, they need to develop much more of a range. Whereas if you're in it for the fame and you know your, your hit and your type, then you'll be called upon to bring a certain persona again and again to the screen. It's less about playing different characters. Oh yeah, each script, your character will have a different name, but essentially you're showing up mainly as yourself with whatever your persona is within that character. Let me give you specific examples from the real world. Take a, an actor like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. He's wonderful at what he does, but is he an actor with a lot of range? Don't know, he's never really been asked to explore that. But mainly, he's built his career on one particular type. He is an action hero. He's larger than life, 
And in every film that we see with him in it, we want to see him. We don't want to see him disappear in the role. And that's great. Arnold Schwarzenegger is another one. And so is Vin Diesel. Now, Arnold has branched out into comedy a bit, but even there, Arnold brings his unique persona. And we want that. We look at him and we always see Arnold. He does not disappear in the role. Um, let's take actresses. Madonna is a perfect example. Madonna is a powerful persona and she is really always Madonna on screen and that's what the audience wants and that is very very bankable. Now let's look at people who are the artists in the business. Gary Oldman literally disappears in many of the roles that he plays. He is a chameleon, truly an actor's actor. If you see him in a film called Prick Up Your Ears, where he plays the playwright Joe Orton, and then you see him in Sid and Nancy, where he plays Sid Vicious, the two are not recognizable. Every time he's in a role, he brings a, you know, in, as a matter of fact, in Tarantino's True Romance, he played a Jamaican drug dealer with the accent, with the, uh, the dreadlocks, the whole, I mean, you had to look twice and go, that's Gary Oldman, this British actor, totally transforms from character to character, film to film. That is acting as an art. He's not bringing one dominant persona every time to every project that he does. Here's an irony. We may feel, some feel that, well, you know, it's more noble to be an artist than it is to be um, a person who's just interested in fame. Well, the marketplace rewards which one more? You got it. The person who is the, who's in it for the fame. Dwayne Johnson gets $20 million for a movie. Al Pacino gets 10. He's even gotten much less. And I guarantee you that Gary Oldman does not command $20 million per movie. So if money's even extremely important to you, then you've got to reconsider why you're in this game and adjust your choices accordingly. Okay, women who are the artists who have also become famous. Meryl Streep, another absolute chameleon. For those of you who haven't seen the movie um, from the play called Angels in America, there's a scene at the very beginning in a synagogue and a rabbi is delivering um, an impassioned sermon from the pulpit. At the end of this film, you discover that that rabbi is Meryl Streep. I mean, I was shocked because she's playing a man and she does it so well. She also plays other characters in the film, women, and they're totally different. Another one is Charlize Theron, very glamorous woman. Well, if you haven't seen Monster, see it. And you ain't going to see glamour there. You're going to see a very unfeminine woman who's dangerous, violent, and definitely a force to be reckoned with. So those are the different directions you can go in and the different choices that each of those directions will demand from you. 
really get clear about this. No better time to do it than now. I'm making this film at the end of December. So as you do some soul searching, reevaluating for the new year, ask yourself, do I really want to be an actor? And why do I want to? And then have fun with the journey. If you've gotten value from this, definitely share your takeaways in the comments below. And if you haven't already, click subscribe and give the video a thumbs up. I'm going to put a link below in the description to the latest online course that I've created, Self Taping Mastery. Everything you need, especially now when self taping is the norm, to, to ace those auditions and book the jobs that you dream about and deserve. And until the next video, always feel it, say it, mean it, book it. But wait, there's more. I wanted to emphasize that if you choose to study stage acting, you must definitely also study voice and movement separately. When you work on stage, there'll be greater demands on your voice than there ever will be in film and TV. You need a very powerful instrument with a very wide range. People have no idea, for instance, what demands Shakespeare makes on the human voice. If your voice isn't trained and you try learning a big Shakespearean role, one of the tragedies, for instance, you'll probably lose your voice before you get through the play. And you should also, well, movement on stage, you're going to need to really command broad, the use of broad, dramatic gestures, much more so than you ever will on film. I want you to know about a book that is fascinating and very much to the point of this topic today. The book is called The Mystic in the Theater, and it was written by a um, British-born American actress named Eva Legallion, who lived at in the early part of the 20th century. The book is about a fascinating actress, uh, late 19th century into the beginning of the early 20th century. Her name was Eleonora Dusa, an Italian actress. This woman had a very, um, it was almost a religious uh, approach to acting. She often said that she didn't have a particular technique. Thing is that she totally transformed when she was on stage. Um, if you saw her in life, her voice wasn't particularly impressive. Um, but when she got onto the stage, she just something ignited in her. She was truly a great artist of the theater. And in the book, Legallion contrasts her with one of her great contemporaries who was very famous, Sarah Bernhardt. Bernhardt was flamboyant, big, larger than life, an actress in her own right, but a very, very different approach to acting. She would be more of the celebrity famous person as opposed to the great um, artist of the theater. A fascinating portrait. That's it. And I won't say it again. You know what to do until the next video.